Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 31st of October, 2023, Halloween for those who care. It's Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics. Great to have you on tonight. And uh, it's an important conversation this evening. Um, Tony LeCantre will join me in a moment just to remind you, as we always do, that uh, we don't provide specific financial or legal advice. It's really important that you understand this is a general conversation only. And uh, that's um, just, you know, the way it is. Um, we're not trying to get into individual recommendations or individual positions for individual people. Do play nice in the chat, please. So no racial slurs. We moderate the chat, of course. This is as at the 31st of October 2023, if you're watching in replay. If you'd like to ask a question or get my attention, if you use at all the world, that then puts it into my stream. And uh, that means that I get to see it. And uh, if you have a question, throw it in the chat. Uh, always time to uh, explore questions from the uh, followers and studio audience, as it were. So feel free to um, throw those questions in. I've also enabled Super Chat, which means that if you'd like to get your question top of the list, you can do that or indeed make a contribution to what we do here. Always appreciated. We do this not for profit, but because we think it's a really important conversation to have, particularly at the current point in time. So without further ado, let me bring Tony in. Tony, hello there. Oh, good day, Martin. Uh, it's actually funny about you losing your voice for a little bit. Uh, we just got back from Japan and I managed to lose my voice. And uh, Juliana said, please don't talk for a few days. And it was the most tranquil three days of my life. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but anyway, it's it's hard for especially a stockbroker to to lose their voice because that's that's pretty much the asset I, I work with. But uh, yeah, probably caught it on the on the flight home from uh, Japan. But um, happy to provide some insights uh, of what I discovered over there. But uh, generally, it's Halloween. Uh, I have three initials for for that: Z, F, G. Work that out yourselves. And I've actually just taken the batteries out of my doorbell. So none of these little sugar addicted gremlins uh, come knocking during the show. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, it is a bit like that, isn't it? And um, yeah, we should talk about Japan because, of course, Japan has gone through a long, slow grind over a long period of time. You know, that's massive real estate boom way back. And then they had a bit of a sort of a, a slowdown. And now, of course, interest rates in Japan are looking as though they could be notching above 1% for the first time for um, a long, long time. So Japan is an interesting case study. And, you know, there is a lot of people who believe that the broader economy, particularly Australia, could actually be following Japan and become, you know, a, a Japan type economy, which is superficially OK. But when you strip below the surface economically, maybe not as much growth as uh, you might might expect. So it'd be worth... Um, worth exploring that i should i owe you an apology uh, tony i think also in terms of the thumbnail for this show tonight i grabbed yeah. it off the video that i did with you that must have been about may or june mm. and, and um gee you've definitely um slimmed down a lot since then yeah happy to happy to share the secrets if anyone believes me or wants wants to listen uh but yeah no that was 17 kilos ago and a prescription of glasses. So yeah, it's, it's all right to see my bigger shots. I wouldn't say it was a fat shot, but yeah, certainly a lot heavier in those days. But at some point, ha happy to run through what I'm doing, a little bit about my research and why I'm never going back to these terrible foods and addictions. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? How sometimes, you know, an, an event or a situation or something changes and, and you know and you and you just make a decision i mean i went through a, a somewhat similar process probably about i was mid mid to late 40s i'd been working very hard and um wasn't getting a lot of um exercise and i was um having a lot of business lunches and things and i suddenly looked to myself one day i thought oh, hang on a moment i seem to be a bit sort of broader and heavier and sort of slower than I've been used to. I used to run a lot of marathons when I, when I was young. And um, I sort of got on the scales and, oh, goodness me. And it, it was like a sort of a, a moment, you know, it was like, a, no, I need to do something, right? And, and having had that point of saying, no, I'm gonna do something, I never actually looked back. But sometimes you do need a bit of a sort of a, um, a trigger point, something to actually, um, you know, stand back and think, no i need to do something what was what was the point that for you that, that i need to do something 
Oh, New Year's Eve last year, I was drinking this low calorie champagne. And I thought, what the hell am I doing? Um, this, I mean, I, I, to get in the police, I was fit as all buggery, went through the police academy, and then suddenly you get out of the get out of the academy. I'm working at Bondi and everyone's delivering fast food for free. So I then obviously it was unhealthy lifestyle, but I just thought, New Year's Eve last year, I'm gonna have a year off alcohol. So I've done that, started lifting weights, uh, which is good. I was actually at a plateau, so I was going to the gym five days a week and my weight and fitness wasn't moving. So then I did a shit ton of research on carnival and here I am now. So Eddie's work has worked uh, tremendously well. Uh, you know, my partner jokes, you've lost half your weight and half your net wealth. So anyway, that's a revolving joke in my house. But yeah, I'm happy to uh, get into it a little bit later. Uh, and uh, I've got certainly got some insights on it. But I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, Martin, but all the bullshit in the food and medical industry, uh, nope, I don't want to bore anyone. My kids are sick of their life lectures I give them, but uh, God, you're no good if you're not healthy and you're not here. So anyway, I've I've had two years of the worst grinding sandpaper to death bear market of my 25 year career. I get the friggin' joke now, but at least I'm here, I'm fighting, I'm fit, I'm mentally alert and mental clarity is what you need. And sadly, I can only imagine what families are going through now and how they have to stay on top of their finances when they've been coasting on cheap money for so long. And you just got to feel sorry for, for what's coming to this country. And heaven help us if we, we turn Japanese, Martin. Heaven. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I called this show the, the coming storm. Mm. And the reason I did that was because we've been talking about the evolution of you know, household finances and the evolution of markets for a good number of years now. We've been doing these shows for quite some time. And we've always said um, it can't continue, right? And, and you and I both said, just remember, folks, long-term interest rates are, you know, 6 7 8% for mortgages and, you know. And it, in that context, this is the 10-year Aussie bond, right? knocking on 5%. Now, I don't know about you, Tony, but I was not totally surprised to see that because of what been happening internationally. But the consequences of this sort of movement in rates is profound. And to my mind, this is part of the story. Now, whether it's a cause or whether it's actually a consequence is something that's worth kicking around. But, you know, the numbers don't lie, do they? No, and that's that's a, an ugly set of numbers. And the basics of the bond market is those that have been in the bond, when interest rates rise, expectations of higher returns and bond prices fall. So the bond market has been absolutely spanked on, on the backside. You look at these major issues, and now there's probably going to come a point where if we're higher for longer, I think you're going to see and the economic risks start to increase uh, and they're saying that we're going to weaken off. I, I think with the level of returns, I think you, you might see a bit of a, a rush back to the bond market. And there's lots of ways now retail investors can get set in that um, through these ETFs. So I think if you, you're looking at, at that side of the market with low risk, decent upside and equities, remain overvalued i think we could see a little bit of a shift there but those those figures are frightening i've been talking to some people that have been on 1.88 percent fixed mortgages yep. and they've now straight on to, to rates just below six uh 30 year fixed loans in the us who would have thought they'd get to eight percent eight percent for a 30 year fixed loan that's just unheard of and again then their market is probably half the price of ours. Their wages are, are a lot lower as well. And I just, you just got to be concerned about what's happening. Uh, I saw some laughable quotes. Uh, bloody retail sales up 0.9. The anticipation was 0.3. And they blame the bloody new iPhone. 
So you got to look at millennials. I mean, so what? iPhone titanium. I'm, I mean, that that was blamed for the strengthening retail sales. Uh, there's a fair chance uh, they're going to hike whilst everyone's had a skinful um, trying to win money on a horse race. So yeah. it's yeah. and it's not going to get any better. And you can't. How the hell are people going to go out and get additional income when they've opened up? Uh, the immigration floodgates to people on student visas. They've taken all the shitty jobs no Australians want to do, and they'll they'll work multiple jobs. They they'll barely sleep to to live the dream of living in this wonderful country. And let's face it, we live in a one of the best countries in the world. And unfortunately, our shitstorm we're right in the eye of it now, and it's only going to get worse because there's zero levers that the RBA can pull because you've got inflation expectations are high. We are addicted to spending and it's it's no relief. I mean, all we had to do was put away our debit cards, credit cards, but no, we're on this binge and we're going to pay for it. And all the bullshit around low interest rates forever, interest rates are never going to go up in our generation. What a, what a crock. How can we go by those lies? When we've reiterated, Martin, the long-term RBA rate is 6.5%. The long-term mortgage rate is over 9%. So put that into your flux capacitor and see where we end up. So, well, that's it. That's it. That's that's the law. And I know I know we haven't seen economic hard times for oh, since the last recession. Maybe there's been some blips. Uh, we, dodged, we dodged the GFC when uh, they handed out gift vouchers for JB Hi-Fi. People, we, we live well above our means. People got to realise is consumerism, you get this dopamine hit, it's like porn, cocaine and sugar, and then you end up with useless shit you can't sell on Gumtree. And we're going to pay for it, all these buy now, pay later. Uh, you see people in, you know, Target, Kmart during Christmas. I've got a total gift ban on Christmas. I'm over it. Why should we go into debt? Why should we struggle to impress other people? But... Look, I'm, in the end, I'm hopeful that we replicate what happened in Ireland and certainly not in Japan. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we'll see how it plays out. Um, Cookie Boy made this post a little while ago, which I just want to bring up, which was um, we all think of um, um, Roger, uh, who unfortunately died, uh, you know, well over a year plus now. But he was another calling this out, right? And he and I recorded a couple of shows, go back and watch them. They are actually available still on my channel. And he said that rates are gonna go higher and they're gonna stay higher. Inflation is gonna stay high. But he also warned, as Cookie said, about the second round of inflation. And, and I think the point is that this inflation battle is not over. And, you know, whilst the politicians in Australia and elsewhere around the world are actually trying to, you know, jawbone the RBA into not lifting rates and trying to sort of explain why inflation isn't as bad as it really looks. Um, when you look at the last inflation numbers, if you take out all the government support that have been thrown in in the last quarter, the inflation would have been a lot higher, whether you look at power or fuel or, or whatever it was. Um, we haven't got the inflation thing under control. The services sector, the wages of rising quite fast. We've got fresh issues with regard to oil because of the international situation there. But the underlying story here is higher for longer. And the higher for longer story means that we can't expect to see interest rates come down over the next year or so, or two maybe. And yeah. no, that's, it's that's, runway yeah. that I worry about, Tony. You know, you can, you, if, if rates go up a little way, or a significant way for a short period of time and come back down, you can survive. But when the taps keep getting turned and turned and turned and then they're held there in that, in that new tense position, it makes it very, very difficult for people to know what to do. And particularly in the situation where if you're a homeowner and you've got a big mortgage and the only other options are trying to rent and with rentals at 1.1% vacancies at the moment, that's ridiculously low you know, relative to um, history. And when you've actually got the situation where if you don't have somewhere to live, then everything else falls apart, you're gonna do absolutely everything you can 
to try and keep paying those mortgages. And I also think it's very interesting that the um, ABA and the banks have started advertising. Did you see the adverts over the last couple of days saying, you know, if you're in difficulty with mortgage stress, come and talk to us. <clears throat> and what are the tricks they're using? Extending the term of the loan, going interest only, taking um, a defer of repayments for a period of time. I mean, all of those things, that actually all benefits the banks because they just get more interest for longer. So you can see how critically um, many people are now you know, precariously balanced between trying to keep everything going or not. Um, now, you and I were talking about this two or three years ago, and, and, and we were both saying, prepare for this, prepare for this. Um, I guess the question I've got is, for those people now caught in the, in the headlights, as it were, what can they do? I mean, it seems to me there's almost no way out. Well, the first thing you can do is sell. Uh, I mean, there's no shame in that. But the problem, families, and particularly husbands, it's going to be a pride issue. And, and if the husband's a major breadwinner, the one that brings in the major salary, they are going to feel embarrassed that things aren't, aren't going that well. I've mentioned numerous times, it only takes a few house sales in a street to see the price drop 20%. There's still idiots uh, buying houses near a meth lab with a chance of a drive-by shooting. So you, you never know, you've got, to, you've got to try your luck. And I, I mentioned at the top of the East Victoria Park bubble in Perth, 2014, uh, the prices were going nuts. We had a beautiful home we couldn't afford because we built, we spent too much on it. And at the home open, it was crickets. But I think the best thing you can do is put it on the market. And the sad part is that once you take into consideration the true costs of owning a home, the true costs of stamp duty and, uh, and other fees, many families are going to be below break even. So what do you do? Do you take the hit now? Do you take the capital loss or do you fight? But I, I just think that it's just going to drain the energy out of the, the couple. Uh, and then, then you start getting other issues coming up. So I, I guess at some point, do when do you capitulate? And it's the same with stocks. You can hang on, hang on, and then suddenly there's, there's capitulation. Uh, the time to sell all your chest freezers and treadmills on Gumtree has long passed. Uh, the used car index, uh, long, no, you've missed your window there. Tarek produced that chart. You could have, could have sold many new cars at a profit. These opportunities are gone. You can quit all your streaming services or stream rotate, but that's just like throwing feathers into a cyclone. How else can you cut out costs when you have to eat as well uh they say meat prices should be falling well the supermarkets aren't passing it on so it's it's worse than being sandpaper to death because i can assure people that there's no worse stress than initially financial and that heads into domestic violence it, it heads into putting off medical dental you know, people will walk around with toothaches now because they can't afford to go to the dentist. People will start pulling their kids out of out of private schools. And suddenly we realise that we'll, we'll sold a massive lie. So unfortunately, unless, um, unless you can jag uh, someone who wants to live in an aspirational area near, as I said, some of those features, or you can jag a money launderer. So I think that's your best bet because these money laundering operations, you never know, you might find a buyer but you know the thing is Martin that all these dressed up houses with the brown brick facades in these uh East Dubbo area East Broken Hill they all look the same they all look the same and eventually no one will give an absolute iota about having an ocean glimpse or close to a park or close to a school because last time I looked every bloody school is a high quality school and people aspire to get in there so uh, the answer to that question, uh, even though my answer was long-winded, is no, uh, where we're, a lot of people, unfortunately, are completely fucked. Mm. And, and they're going to have to wait. They're going to have to wait for their parents to die, uh, unfortunately, because that's their only escape. If they can hold off during that probate period, I know this sounds macabre and not nice, but uh, people are going to do anything to save themselves, and it's going to be every family for themselves. 
Yeah, I don't know. It's just tough. I mean, again, um, I've said this a few times, you know, it amazes me that uh, quite a few people still who are in, you know, some degree of difficulty don't understand just how much difficulty they're in because they don't necessarily have the knowledge about their finances to understand what money's coming in, what money's going out and where where is it going? And, um, you know, I, I, I through my surveys, um, analyzed this in, in, in some detail. And it is still quite frightening how people are prioritizing what money they've got into things that, well, you know, do you really need all of those streaming services? Do you really need all those mobile phone plans with unlimited this and unlimited that? Um, you know, it's sort of trying to turn the, um, the ship around a bit. One of the interesting observations, in fact, Edwin mentioned this yesterday, was, um, you know, people are not going out as much to eat out as much. What they're doing is actually eating at home and cooking their own stuff, which may actually be <laughs> a lot better thinking about it from our earlier conversation. Um, but there are some life char lifestyle changes that Im are implied by that, right? In terms of, you know, hunkering down and those sorts of things. Um, I guess the other point I, I keep coming back to is this, the rise in personal credit is one that's actually, the data that came out today showed that personal credit was up again. And um, in my surveys, I'm seeing quite a concentration amongst those who have big debts and mortgage stress or, or big rental problems. They're just grabbing more credit. So that there's still this idea that if I can hang on and if I can grab a bit more credit from here, there and everywhere by buy now, pay later or, you know, other forms of credit um, I can get by but you know and I know that that's okay for a short term but not it's not a fix is it oh ab absolutely not and it, it is it is desperation uh, you know are, are more people going to start turning to gambling uh, which is another dreaded addiction uh, you'll see certain lotteries people start playing more they'll try and gamble their way out, or as surveys have shown, um, five to 10% will go out and commit commit petty theft to, to survive. And I, I'll go back to Japan. What I did notice about the the people there, they are respectful. Uh, pe you know, you leave your bike on the street, no one's got anything locked. Uh, there's zero tolerance, not much tolerance for crime. There's no graffiti. You never feel unsafe. Uh, one of the extravagances was I took my sons to a Post Malone concert uh, in Tokyo, the most well-behaved crowd you'll ever see. And they've had over 30 years of being in, in economic shit, yet the people are still respectful. Um, I cannot see that happening in Australia at, at all. I just think that uh, where... You know, we've got, there's, the respect levels are low. Everywhere's covered in graffiti. People don't mind just stealing, robbing people, breaking enters, all of that. And I think a lot of those beautiful enclaves out west, you know, that orange mudgy area or slightly east of it, are just going to turn into ghettos. And you'll start noticing it when people don't care for their gardens or they don't wash their cars. Because, you know, you look at these beautiful SUVs, and to get them detailed, you're up for about three hundred dollars. And you know, looking at cost cutting, every time I drive past a Muzz Buzz and there's a massive queue, I, I cringe. I mean, that's for us. That was one of the first things to go. These days, when I go out, I only order steak and salt, so I don't need to go to a restaurant. Uh, actually, it's funny. I found it quite hard in Japan because everything's tempura this, tempura that. I, I didn't understand what was what. So I made friends with the local McDonald's who sold me um, beef patties with cheese and um, beautiful Wagyu, mind you. But do we really need to go out and pay $50 for an average steak? Uh, and what I've noticed is not drinking has made me not spend as much going out. Do you really need to sink two bottles of wine and then you spend probably 50 bucks plus on Uber? So yes, we're going to stop spending. That's going to affect all these people that went out on low interest and thought, hey, I can copy what these people have done, set up a successful restaurant. And unfortunately, it's just going to, it snowballs because once we stop spending, they're not, they haven't got the revenue, they haven't got the rents. And you're seeing, you're going to see a lot of restaurants now leased out with full kitchens. I mean, you just, and they're going to desert them. So that's, we are certainly going to stop spending 
and those struggling are probably going to go on to the lower quality uh, mints, which, funny enough, is actually better for you. Yeah, it is interesting. It, it goes back to, perhaps to the Western values that uh, underpin, you know, what's what's happened over the last, um, um, you know, two decades. And I was reading a survey the other day. Kids in um, various countries were asked about what they aspired to be when they grew up. And I thought it was a really interesting contrast. The f number one in the US, number one um, occupation was actually YouTube content creator for people in the US. In China, the number one aspiration was to be an astronaut. <laughs> and I thought that was a really interesting contrast. Oh, amazing. Or you could just be a five-year-old kid who opens up toys and be worth gazillions. So oh, I just don't get, I don't get any of that. Uh, there's, you know, this TikTok generation, there's just not much talent. And all it's done is, you know, the world isn't that remarkable. And all we're seeing is all these garbage that tries to make it seem like a wonderful, remarkable world when, when in fact it isn't. But, um, Oh God! What do you, what do you aspire to these days uh, for kids? You've got AI. You've got t trying to take over. Um, where do they go? Obviously, I think there's going to be demand for probably one of the highest growth areas. Sadly, is going to be psychologists and psychiatrists uh, dealing with mental health, which unfortunately is going to go exponential in in numbers. Yeah, well, I think some of the the, the consequences, and in fact, uh, Cookie Boy earlier on mentioned the um, the point that you made previously about the you know the rate of crime is likely to increase, and that means insurance premiums are going to go up. We've seen insurance premiums go through the roof in um, a number of areas in, around the world, not just in the in Australia, but uh, in the UK too, and uh, and elsewhere too. And that's because, of course, if you can't um, um, you know survive by legal means, then you well you break the rules, don't you? Yeah, and you know, you've got to feel sorry for the people in Lismore um, trying to get insurance. Well, if you can get insurance, you're up for 40, 50 grand a year, for Christ's sake. And I, I know my premiums have gone, have skyrocketed. Uh, I live in a reasonably good suburb in Perth. And then that's just adding, adding to it. And uh, again, but these days, the risk reward of committing insurance fraud, it's the odds aren't in your favour, but um, people are certainly going to do it. No, absolutely. Yeah, we just come back to Japan a bit because there was one interesting um, observation. The um, this is the um, Japan USD, right, which is now at one hundred and fifty, <clears throat> which is um, as high as it's been. And uh, the um, central bank government in Japan previously said that um, you know if it got too high, they would actually intervene. So um, we are now starting to see the prospect of higher interest rates in Japan. And when you were there, did you notice much in the way of um, sensitivity to rates or, or were people just um, no. so used to low rates that it really wasn't an issue? I, I, I didn't uh, notice any of that. All I noticed was that they're absolute masters of scrolling their phones while standing like in a tin of sardines on a train. <laughs> Un unbelievable. Uh, I didn't see huge amounts of consumerism there at all. What I did notice was the rail network. Um, you go to Wynyard Railway Station these days, and you look at the the spend expenditure on infrastructure in Australia compared to there. I mean, their subway is antiquated. It's old. Uh, a lot of it is in dire need of repair. Uh, Traffic-wise, uh, not a lot of traffic for such a big city. Uh, everyone was pretty respectful on, on the roads. We did do a day trip out to Kamakura, which is a beachside suburb with lovely grey sand, um, not the best beach. Uh, you know, Australia beaches, Australian beaches are much better. And these equivalent were still a million dollars to live in small units. So the dream of a beachside enclave is still quite high, Martin. But um, yeah, unbelievably expensive. Uh, but again, you know, I went to a lot of the supermarkets where Food is actually reasonable value there. And uh, if I had a fry pan, I could live like a king. But um, no, I didn't really notice anything. I did, as I said, had a bit of a look at property prices, but um, no, nothing really major there. And I can see that what they've been through, their ginormous bubble, which they, as a, as a race, they thought they were immune to speculation, that it wouldn't happen to them. 
And guess what? The market was rigged by the government. The stock market was rigged by housewives. I think there was one woman that controlled a lot of it. And these large broking firms were offered incentives to, to sell shit stocks to people. And when you've got a stock market trading at 80 times and you've got all Nippon Airways trading at 1,400 times PE, uh, the palace was worth more than the entire area of Manhattan. That's a ginormous bubble. And to have three lost decades where you can sense in that city a lot hasn't been invested and people on, on the, to your face are still nice to you. So they've, I think they've done exceptionally well uh, where they're at. And then you read stories about not only the, the demographic cliff, which is the next nightmare coming, uh, but there's not going to be enough people to wipe out backsides in nursing homes. And then suddenly uh, the elderly are committing petty theft to, to go into prison to get looked after and to have friends. So... Um, Oh, geez, we don't certainly don't want that here. No. Interestingly, I used to work for a, a Japanese firm, Fujitsu, actually. And um, so I had quite a lot to do with the, um, the Japanese culture and, and the way that they thought about things. And um, I was doing a lot to talk about interest rates and mm. how it actually impacted households. And it was like, no, not the same are there. And that's because, of course, they've had well low 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 rates for so long and um you, you say it's manipulated it's in, you know it's all because of oh, the heavily. way yeah. it's the structure of their financial system and um it is interesting that the new the new governor is now talking about um uh, now maybe having to take rates a little higher but still still way way low relative to um relative to the rest of the world now let's just switch across to um the US because of course the Dow is now back down to sort of levels that well we saw at the start of the year so it's almost like this year hasn't happened in terms of um, any major impact um, but the um, technical index you know the um, the Nasdaq is still up high but it's up high because of these seven stocks the AI stocks um, What's your take on, on on the sort of the latest? We saw um, Tesla drop back dramatically. Um, we saw um, Nvidia come back, still strong but less strong. Um, but it still looks to me as though the AI wave is still there and the people are still believing in it. Um, are they over over egging the cake? Do you think? Well, I went to a uh, Better Shares uh, lunch in Perth. Now, Better Shares run uh, a lot of ETFs. And he put up an interesting chart where the Magnificent Seven uh, has dominated most of the S&P 500 rally. And the rest of the S&P 500, I uh, should reiterate, there's there's actually 503 stock uh, shares in the S&P 500 because there's a couple of other classes. But if you look at that Magnificent Seven, the rest of the market has done diddly squat. And what's happening uh, since July the Magnificent Seven aren't really participating in the rally now. So those that have bet against the S&P 500 um, should feel somewhat robbed that they've the returns have been skewed uh, for seven stocks. And you've got to look at the state of the economy over there. Now, if these seven continue to underperform, then there's going to be some index pressure. So... I don't see any real momentum in, in US markets, uh, S&P, NASDAQ or, or Dow. Uh, these BBUS got down into the sevens, they're now in the nines. I just thought that was amazing value. When, when you look at the actual breakup of the market and what's driving it, and now uh, if we have a look at Australia, we're seeing um, uh, Gemma Acton, who, who's a great finance reporter, putting up charts saying the S&P ASX 200 has done, done bugger, bugger all for 16 years because it was at levels uh, just before, prior to the GFC. But you don't, obviously that doesn't take into account dividends and the shitty companies that have entered and exited that index. So I, I'm not an index hugger. I know the press love to focus on uh, people are concerned about this, they're worried about Israel, they're worried about fuel prices. I mean, that's just headlines, but 
in the case of the US market, uh, we're now at the point where it uh, probably will taper off and those that have rightfully bet against the US economy will start to see some returns. But it just goes to show you that things can certainly go against you uh, on, on the markets. So do you think um, it's time for some decent stock picking? So, you know, th there were a lot of people over the last two or three years that there's no point in picking stocks because the index will actually, you know, is driving higher. And so they basically have these um, ETFs that were actually aligned to the index plus or minus. Um, I was reading something the other day that, um, you know, was saying, no, 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 actually now maybe the time is to really understand that not all stocks are the same, you know, using the example of the, um, you know, and the Magnificent Seven and everyone else. You actually got to do the, the fundamentals and begin to understand that um, there are some businesses that are intrinsically better than other businesses and uh, some businesses that have, um, you know, revenue streams that are more secure, even in an uncertain world relative to others. So is stock picking back in town? Oh, most most definitely. But I guess while you've still got access to these ETFs, I know that uh, you're going to have ETFs now you can buy. Uh, I know Better Shares, I think, have launched a service where you don't pay any brokerage to buy an ETF. Uh, they're, they're pushed. Uh, I guess you can average down and up on an index ETF. But who really has the time um, to go out and do all this research when people can't wait for the microwave to finish, they can't wait a minute, or they're addicted to scrolling TikTok and YouTube shorts the whole time. So I just think long-term investing, uh, the interest in that is exceptionally low. Uh, we've had a generation addicted to trading crypto and the board Ape Yacht Club. I remember that, guys. I mean, where the hell's that gone now? <laughs> so yes. And I, I uh, there's a book called A Hundred Baggers by Chris Mayer, which I, I highly recommend. And I think the one of the quickest stocks to hundred bag in the US was Monster Energy Drinks. So it can be done or Southwest Airlines. So sometimes traditional boring businesses can outperform. But if, if you look at some of the stocks in Australia, uh, the banks have done diddly squat. They've corrected. Um, Commonwealth Bank likes to hover around $100. They're actually starting to lose mortgage share. So I think there's scope there to do research. Uh, of, I'm obviously heavily focused on highly speculative stocks, but I am looking at small industrials that do have solid earnings, are going to start paying nice dividends, and have that four, five hundred percent growth in them over the medium term. Uh, some of them trade via appointment, so they're hard to really get in and get out of. It's a bit, a bit of a lobster pot. So yeah, uh, I, I find every few months I will grab the financial review and a highlighter and go through the entire market. But there is, I just think that just like music will hopefully get back to guitars, bass, and drums, I think financial markets and our way of living will get back to the way it should be. And that's this, you know, it's Warren Buffett, old school style, investing for the long term, saving a lot of money, not spending more than you earn. But yeah, definitely, I think the stock pickers market is, is returning. And I think you're seeing a lot of craziness on the Australian resource stocks at the moment. And unfortunately, I think that's got a little bit to do with ego. But I might be wrong. <laughs> oh, there's no ego in the markets. I'm, uh, I'm shocked that you'd even suggest it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I Gina Reinhart does a hell of a lot. Uh, you saw her. Uh, I don't know. People over in the east probably wouldn't realise telethon. We've got this long-running telethon. Uh, I think it created another new high of 77 million donated i just think it's like a stock market uh, telethon donations are getting tired maybe we need to have a couple of down years just to reinvigorate invigorate but gina's just going nuts on the lithium sector um stepped into a stock called line town around three dollars uh and, and he's now trying to block other takeovers so is there a real concern over lithium and supply um who knows but i just wonder if you know, like WTF guys, well, what's going on? Because I know that it's not hard, it's not hard to lose money in this market, but her $3 uh, investment not that long ago is now worth $1.60. But 
Uh, what would I know? I guess she's made a shit ton of money out of iron ore, but what's really going on in the lithium sector? So what do you say then? You know, you've got a, a portfolio of clients who must be, um, you know, concerned about the way the markets are going at the moment. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what are your sort of messages in terms of, um, you know, hang, hang in there and, you know, we've got to see this through or, um, you know, or, or, or are you seeing signs of panic from, from some people's thinking, I've got to get out, got to get out. What, what are you seeing? Well, I think we've had, it's been so bad. We've had a grinding two years of just no appreciation for many, many stocks. And some of them, when, when you're in these times where you need to grow a company and the capital markets, the taps turned off, you need to raise money at huge discounts. And I've just had a couple of companies that have forced to go out on the market and raise at around 30% discounts. And that that hurts. That, that's, a, that's a slap in the face for loyalty. But these, these biotechs, uh, one of them's extending the lives of people with brain cancer and they're putting drugs into trials but they need money and you have to just do it at that discount so i'm saying to my clients look here's the opportunity you either take up more shares or, or you hold uh mining stocks outside of lithium and to an extent rare earths uh copper stocks have just been absolutely poleaxed and the australian dollar gold price has just come off an all-time high uh, I think it's trading around three thousand one hundred and thirty-six dollars an ounce. We're going to actually start to see producers hedge, Martin. Uh, they'll start to lock in high gold prices. Hopefully, they can deliver. But the gold juniors, uh, it's funny how you can get a commodity so right, yet the equities have been in in the dog box for years now. And I'll, I'll look at the steep discounts in some of these gold companies with ounces in the ground. And instead of 60 to 80 bucks an ounce, some of them are trading at 10 to 20. And what, what I'm seeing is we just need some more M&A in the gold and silver sector. And once things take off, um, there's no bubble like a gold bubble. Uh, there's been a bit of interest in uranium. Uh, most Western mines, uranium producers need about $90 a pound to break even. $80 a pound to incentivize new production. I think the push to nuclear is again real. So uranium stocks have had a bit of bit of sunshine. Uh, lithium, as, as I mentioned, the takeover frenzy, the rush for lithium in the Pilbara. Uh, there was a most interesting 60 minutes uh, segment on rare earths. And I, I'd strongly suggest that those interested in the sector chase this up. I think I, I tweeted it actually. So, and you've got to look at how the Chinese control the market and they've stopped, I think they've stopped supplying the rare earth for, to Japan that helps them make night vision goggles. Hmm. So it just goes to show you how much control, uh, sorry, China has over the rare earth market. And I thought um, Kim Beasley, whether whether or not you had a high opinion on of him as a politician. He actually spoke really well. And I'm thinking, well, wait a sec, could we have another resurgence in rare earths? And it might be worth positioning. I, I know that my clients where we had a bit of an accidental rare earths discovery. So we're we're sitting quite nicely at the moment. But I mean these these issue, issues are real and China controls it and they can turn the tap off and then suddenly the world's fucked in relation to having the supply of the rare earths needed especially for for military well that might also help to explain the recent um, discussions between uh, australia and the us with regard to you know the the mm. rare earths and the um the support from the us to help um you know alternative um um, sources, I suppose, which is part of the story, isn't it? But it's interesting, Jason um, actually asked this, which is sort of on the same line, which is um, to do with uh, the rare earth metals. Um, is the industry trying to uh, encourage creation of it? Is it a good option to invest in, say, I want to say geranium, but it's germanium. Uh, That's the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> geraniums are something rather different, a bit more flowery. Um, given Chinese <laughs> largest supplier of it, um, <clears throat> and and it's making the point, isn't there, that there is actually um, 
a, a bit of a sort of a battle going on. And as you say, yeah. China has it, a lot of the control of a lot of it at the moment. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the one that goes into the night vision goggles. Mm. Uh, and, well, the, the, the crux of the story was that 30 years ago, a uh, guy to Luca made a discovery. And they've sat on that stockpile of rare earths for, for 30 years. And at the time, it was worthless. So now they're getting some government help to mine it. But the problem you've got with rare earths, uh, just like lithium, is that you can, sadly, you can get the commodity right, but you can, you can buy the wrong company. So what has been happening in Australia is a lot of the juniors will just bring out uh, drilling results, which look great, uh, but they, they haven't done the metallurgy. And the metallurgy, metallurgy is actually key because it's no good if you can't extract the stuff so i look to be honest i'm expecting that the government's pledged what a couple of billion dollars for this some of the uh state governments are quite generous with uh drilling grants uh i i am going to suggest one one to look at um one of my longest term relationships in the junior market uh longer than both my marriages combined has been uh, Red Metal, and they've made a potentially a world first discovery near Mount Isa, 20 kilometres from Mount Isa. And I know, I think Glencore are closing down their copper operations. So I think there's going to be an incentive there. But again, if you can't extract it from the rock, uh, it's worthless. So there, there are lots of risks, but certainly it's, it's a sector that could be. Uh, reinvigorated because the last crazy rare earth bubble was back in 2010, 2011, uh, when Linus was training at, at 20 cents. So, look, I think it's a sector certainly to look at, but you have to look at the ultimate profitability, the production risks, and the rare earth mix as to what is required, uh, such as magnets or what goes into the military, or as mentioned twice previously, uh, night vision goggles. Yeah, interesting because we've um, uh, got a follow-up from Jason there as well, um, which is, I'll just put on the screen, uh, which is um, why would China supply resources that are required for military equipment which could be used against it? Not going to happen in my opinion, especially in the current times, which is an interesting take on it. Yeah, well, I think that just uh, means simply Australia needs to get its shit together and, and fast. And what, what they're actually playing with the Japanese, I, I think, is obviously of concern. But again, go, go back and watch that. Go, go back and watch that segment because it's certainly enlightening. But uh, we have the arguably the best reserves and the best mixes of rare earths on, on the planet yet we've been really slow uh, to develop it because, as you know, these mines take a lot of time. And heaven help you if you've got a rare frog or a rare insect in that area and you have to go through all these heritage clearances. And then we've had that um, disaster with the WA heritage laws, which they had to repeal. So you look at all the, the lawyers' fees and piles of paper just to bloody mine something that is of critical importance. So um, sometimes you just got to to put our national interests ahead of that of a um, a rare frog. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just interesting, isn't it, how some of the um, decision-making processes seem to get sort of caught in the in, in, in the traps. And um, I guess um, there's always a question about, um, you know, do you always go on exploiting and, and, and trying to find more? But I, I, it comes to a broader question, Tony, and that is that the... Mm -hmm. It's a growth question, right? Our growth, the GDP growth in Australia and many other Western countries are still very low. And, the, and, and with the higher interest rates and with the higher cost of capital that that implies, it seems to me it's quite likely that we're going to see very anemic growth for a long period of time. And in fact, I don't see where the levers of growth are and I'd also perhaps suggesting we're coming to the point where we're almost at the end of growth you know the, the, there'll be a point at which it will be impossible to to grow anymore because we, you know the resources won't allow it then the question is well if, if if growth is much more limited and therefore the ability to be able to actually take tax off that and and fund things means 
the structural deficit that we've got in Australia and many other countries have got too are going to get worse and worse. And it gets to the point of asking the question is whether we are actually in a sustainable environment at all or whether in fact we're in the situation where the tax rates will have to continue to go up. The OECD quite recently suggested that we should be putting GST on a much wider range of goods and services including education. Um, you know the tax drift is already there although of course there is the um, third stage tax cuts that are still out I think next year. Um, looks to me as though the um, the budget's pretty much messed up. Yeah, I think, honestly, let's just hit control or or delete on Western society. I think that would solve everything. Uh, Or just switch your computer off and on and hope, hopefully the problem's fixed. But you're, you're absolutely right because now we have, you know, we have an aging population, uh, a lot of infrastructure is going to start to decay, uh, like parts of parts of Japan and Tokyo. We don't have the youth to to drive it. Uh, you look at a country like Brazil. I mean, that's been a bigger gunner than Axel Rose. I remember reading, oh, I think on a train in 1994, how Brazil is going to be the economic powerhouse. Uh, you look at India. India certainly has a lot of growth ahead of it but you look at their superstitions you look at their love of cricket and brett lee and bollywood but you've got to start somewhere firstly give 700 million indians a toilet for starters i still see yeah india's probably a chance uh i actually emceed a gold conference in sydney and uh one of the international commentators mentioned that the growth engines of the world are going to be indonesia uh, which is another bigger gunner than Navarone and Vietnam. So let's let's wait and see because certainly not going to be from here, even though we've got immigration. Uh, you look at the US, you look at their, how they maintain themselves as well and with their astronomical interest rates. So yeah, um, the big three or the big tips are certainly Vietnam and Indonesia. But I guess Indonesia's got the youthful population, the same as Vietnam. Can they offer incentives for foreign companies to move there, just like the Irish did prior to the Celtic uh, tiger turning to shit? So spot on, Martin. Spot on in in that regard, uh, based on the fact that the costs of construction all escalated. and interestingly, um, Toyota have come out and cast doubts on the EV revolution. Yep. And they still invest heavily in ICE vehicles. And I find that staggering. Uh, you look at the share price of Tesla, he's going to have to start cutting costs. And there was an article here in, in Perth on John Hughes, which is our most famous car dealer. And he's saying he's, he's not going to buy not going to touch use Teslas because of the replacement battery costs and consumers aren't factoring that in. And there's certainly not going to be enough copper discoveries or supplies of critical minerals to fuel this uh, EV dream. So there you go. And, you know, a lot of the copper is at 4,000 metres above sea level under a percent and new discoveries take years. So I, I think a lot of the shit we're being sold is um, a Fugazi. <laughs> right, yeah. And um, I always think um, election cycles, you know, election cycles mm. are um, the be all and end all of what happens and uh, what people talk about. And uh, um, quite often, you know, there are issues which should be being explored, which probably aren't because they're more complex and, and more difficult. And I guess a lot of people in the political machine hope that people aren't actually taking too much time to take too much notice of what they're actually doing. Um, but, uh, you know, the bottom line is is that actually there are some really, really big questions here. And I have to say that I, my own view of um, what the Treasurer has been doing relatively recently, which is to jawbone the, um, the RBA into not lifting rates, um, despite the fact that we said earlier on, there are a lot of indicators that suggest that um, they probably should lift rates again. I don't know what your perspective is, but my view is they should definitely be higher than they are. The um, inflation is still getting away from us. Um, but it's, it's almost like 
there are things that um, the government doesn't want to talk about and there are things that um, um, they want to try and misdirect on and look over here. I also argue, by the way, just in passing, I think the whole voice thing was a bit of a, uh, you know, look over there rather than over here, you know, we'll keep you distracted from mm. some of these other things. Um, but, you know, there are some really, really big and important issues. And, and, and I guess the other side of it, as, as I sort of think about this, and I come back to individual households and businesses, in my surveys, I'm seeing more and more businesses failing you know in the construction sector and and elsewhere i'm seeing more households running out of runway in terms of actually their their cash flows and and whilst there's some lip service to that um i don't think that a lot of the conversation is really serious in terms of trying to actually you know get a grip of some of those uh, those issues it's almost like oh yeah it's happening but you know it's not really that serious and uh there's a real disconnect and i don't know whether whether it's just my age, but it seems to me that the disconnect has got worse. The number of dissonant things going on around the world has got worse. And it's like, we're still trying to do the same thing again and again and expect a different outcome. Well, maybe it's time to say, well, hang on a moment, this sort of neoliberal philosophical view of that's driven you know, markets to where they are and it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked for ordinary ordinary people. It's worked for the few. You know, if you look at the wealth distribution, um, they've done really well, you know, the, the, the few percent. But for ordinary businesses and ordinary households, it's actually not worked at all for them. And yet it's still being perpetuated. So, you know, I, I, I get to the point of thinking, Maybe it's mm. maybe it's me. Um, maybe I'm too old. But no, I think I think there's something more more significant than that going on. Oh, absolutely. And there's one word uh, that spells trouble in my household, and that's uh, when I hear "sweetheart." I know, I know, I'm in the shit. <laughs> but these two words, these two words, the new RBA governor has, uh, which I think are frightening, is low tolerance. Mm. So she's going to keep keep on banging on about low tolerance and to me uh she's 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 got some courage this one i don't think she's going to take any shit from anyone i um she speaks with authority she speaks direct and if she has to lift rates on melbourne cup day uh then december so be it but all the figures suggest that maybe she should in november uh where a slight chance in december and thankfully, the RBA doesn't meet in, in January. But they are looking at uh, coming up with less meetings, I believe, as well, which I don't know how that's going to work. Well, that was, of course, a, re- a recommendation from the um, review of the RBA, which, um, well, they basically said, we'll just meet less frequency and we'll frequently and we'll follow the, um, you know, the pattern of other central banks around the world. But it doesn't, I mean, it really didn't make much in terms of change of trajectory, almost almost nothing. Um, although interestingly, yeah. of course, Chalmers hasn't been appointed a, a deputy um, governor at the moment, so that she's one down, right? Mm. And it's interesting that um, the the Treasury guy who sits on the RBA board pretty much all but said that he would be voting against a further rate rise. And Chalmers basically said, well, the inflation is still very much within what we expected it to be, so there shouldn't be any moves. I mean, it's like they're replying all of the, all of the sort of the pressure points. But I agree with you. You know, if she is not going to be um, independent and, and, and take a stand and say, no, no, we've got to do this, um, then why is the RBA there at all? Well... Finally, maybe someone who recognises that the bond market exists, mm. that you can't come up with um, bullshit when they say it's plausible that rates uh, won't rise till 2024. He said plausible. He didn't make any promises. And anyone that banked on that statement, I mean, you're not going to launch a class action against him. But still, uh, you know, we're in this situation where interest rate increases have reverted back to fundamentals and at some point eastern states property markets are going to revert back to fundamentals and in some cases they're going to overshoot to the downside and i've i've had my two years of pain in in my position in solid small cap companies that have struggled due to a lack of interest and money going elsewhere now 
you look at a two-year negative market on property and that's going to be Armageddon. And I go back to the the election miracle with Morrison, uh, what was it, 2019? Um, I was arguably on track to win that bet with the kook and things were going along. We were having a nice, normal, needed correction and then suddenly COVID hit. And I can tell you health-wise and financially, that's going to be the worst thing to happen to this generation because let's face it, the world's gone batshit crazy on cheap money. We've had lots of scams, frauds. Uh, you look at all these new people, new rock stars who have just walked away with billions of dollars. And as I said, control, alt, delete the Western world. And even the the non-Western countries are getting caught up in the, the speculation and, all, and what's going on. And uh, we're now just drowning in dopamine. So again, we you can't have a, a soft landing from here. It's just absolutely impossible without a world of pain. And I think one of the major false belief, major false beliefs in society is that the government are going to bail us out. Well, guess what? Look what, uh, well, not to say the government, well, look at what the RBA has done um, from 0.1 to 4.1 with the threat of, you know, 4.6 in 18 months. So no one's going to bail us out. If you if you go out and take the risks and speculate and borrow a shit ton of money, uh, interest rates under 2% with the belief interest rates will never rise, and you're a speculator, you deserve to get taught a lesson like I get taught regular lessons on the stock market. So it's, you know, property speculation is no different to speculation on the stock market and you are going to see some nasty stuff where people aren't going to want certain properties. They're not going to want land. They're not going to want development sites. And some of them in some areas are going to drop that 60, 70% uh, where they can't, there's no, there's no buyers. So that's, that's speculation. Yeah. And just on the property thing, um, three points, of course, we've got very high migration, 560,000, I think was the last number I saw over the last 12 months. And as you said, there are all those are student my, um, migrants and, uh, and other categories, but some of them are buying are buying property. Um, the consumer confidence is still in the gutter. This is um, slightly out of date, but it's it's pretty close to to the truth. Um, but for me, it's um, this one that really actually um, is the killer slide. This is the average full time earnings compared with the average dwelling price and you can see basically that since 1970 we've seen full-time earnings double and we've seen real dwelling prices four times <laughs> four times so you know the, the 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 gap between what people are earning and the price of property they're aspiring to buy shows you that we are in an absolute mega bubble and yeah. I, I don't know, but many people just say, no, 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 it's, this, this is all fine. I don't think this is fine. I think this shows you that reversion to mean suggests that there is still significant downside potentially ahead. Yeah, and I, you know, price to income like uh, PE ratio is certainly a basic, it's a very basic measure. It doesn't take into account a, lo a lot of factors, but when you're trading at 13.3 in Sydney, uh, still high numbers. And then we've got uh, the Perth market, which was six six times. And now that's that's growing because uh, we've got Eastern state investors now buying up houses in Perth without even looking at them. Uh, is six to seven times going to be the new norm? Uh, it's still relatively expensive when you look at the long-term trends. So. I think it's got a long way to unwind. I think you're going to have a lot of forced sales. I think, honestly, I know it's taken a lot longer because we did have interest rates at, at point one, uh, two year fixed uh, under two, but I still think we're, we're a chance of uh, doing what Ireland did. And that's, that's going to be ugly and it's going to take years to recover and then you, you'll start getting back to long-term growth trends which are you know in real house prices are one to two percent uh not like i looked at our 
my parents' old house we built in French's Forest, uh, where that growth since then has come in at 6% on an annualised basis to get where we are now. But that growth's come in a lot in the last few years. So, you know, you, uh, real house prices don't grow by that much. And once interest rates continue to normalise, uh, which sadly they are, um, there's going to be more pressure. And we've still got families, as I mentioned earlier, Martin, hanging on. Our buffers are being certainly worn down. Uh, they're going to be scrounging for cash. I mean, finding $2 coins in the lounge or it's going to be a win in some cases. And I know that uh, I've certainly um, cut down on my spending. Uh, obviously, my income is linked to activity on the stock market and, and it's taken a hit. So you've got to do what you have to do to survive. Um, you cut down your spending. Uh, I yeah, I believed years ago that credit cards were evil, so I, I got rid of it um, many years ago, took the pain of a personal loan to get through it. But I certainly have lived well beyond my means, and it's, I can assure you it doesn't make you any happier. Look, I actually find um, a lot of enjoyment out of finding um, reasonable value scotch fillet and ribeye steak and... I'm always on the hunt for barramundi um, at a good price. I, I actually, that sparks more joy than um, buying my partner a handbag. <laughs> well, you certainly can't eat the handbag. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, it's interesting because Cookie Boy, um, I'll just put it up on the screen. Um, yeah. Cookie Boy said, <clears throat> could we see an emigration problem like in Ireland during the early stage of the GFC? The Polish left in droves. I guess the point is it depends on what's happening in other parts of the world. Yeah. Because one of the things I think people probably should understand is that Australia is perceived by many as still an attractive place to come. And, uh, you know, that may change if we go into a recession in Australia and uh, with, uh, you know, property where it is and everything else, there are a lot of uh, downsides. But um, relatively speaking, so many would say, I think that Australia is still a more attractive place than uh, you know, many, many other places around the world. Now, if that were to change, then certainly you've got a very migrant population that could drift away. And if migration took people away, the demand would probably fall and that would actually put more downward price pressure. And look, you know, there, there are reasons, there are reasons why the government wanted high migration. And it's to do with just pure GDP. If you bring more people in, they spend more, they pay more tax, and that means that your top line GDP number goes up so that you can avoid a technical recession. That's the why that's why it's being done. The real measure of GDP per capita, and of course we've been going backwards there for some long time, but that's not the one that the economists choose to focus on, nor indeed the government choose to focus on. I think it's one they should actually. But it shows you that it depends a little bit on, on the lens that you use as to why you do what they do. But to my mind, this stupid amount of migration was never flagged pre the, the last election. In fact, Alba was more on the downside rather than the upside of, of migration, but then turned turtle soon after. And so we've actually got a migration boom that is forcing all sorts of things off, off the scale that was never actually voted for? Well, I think uh, in, in relation to uh, your question, where the hell are these people going to go? Mm. Uh, they they tend to come over here and, and work their asses off. They'll work at night. They'll work multiple jobs. And if they work hard enough, they can actually live here reasonably comfortably compared to, to the country they came from. And I'm thinking, well, where the hell are they going to go? Um, are they going to go to another, you know, Tasmania? Are they going to go to New Zealand? Uh, are they going to go to the potential growth powerhouses that are Vietnam and Indonesia? Where the hell are they going to go? Uh, UK's up the shit. Um, US, ditto. Um, where else Where else do they go? Um, I, I, I don't know. My uh, Juliana was reading some magazine. She said, oh, Apparently, Portugal's a cheap, nice place to retire. Um, well, that window will close. Um, where do they go? I mean, this let's face it, Australia is one of the most beautiful countries on earth. It's relatively safe. 
We've got a high standard of living, uh, everything going for it, healthcare, food, uh, you can do what you want here. And people are going to find that extremely attractive. But we've just got a massive housing crisis at the moment. And, you know, these people that come in are prepared to to share rooms. Um, a lot of Australian kids refuse to share a room. They'll give you some bullshit that they don't want to see their sister get changed. And then they demand a backyard off the parents where, where they never go outside. So I just think that Australians have, have this sense of entitlement, whereas the people coming in are going to, on the whole, work their asses off and take away the jobs that some of our kids should be doing because they don't want to work. They just want to scroll on their phones and get a handout from mum and dad. So I, I think you've got to look at the discipline and worth, work ethic of the people coming in. And I can understand why the Polish bailed out of out of Ireland. Um, but now I've read commentary where they're saying that Poland's actually got it right. Mm. Yeah, it is interesting. I actually did some work in Poland years ago, and it was very interesting watching the entrepreneurial side come back after the um, you know the the sort of the Eastern Bloc influence. And it was quite interesting just watching that. Uh, evolve and develop so it's quite fascinating and um, jason made an interesting comment which i'll just put up again um we have four year terms of government they only think short term we need longer term thinking but it seems all about election cycles mm. sadly and i think that's right i mean to my mind the political thing has overtaken pretty much everything else there's no strategy there's no strategic thinking about what sort of place do we want to be what are the sort of the, the norms that we aspire to have it's all about ticking the box on the numbers and ticking the box on the next election cycle and by the way i think um albo is probably indifferently looking at the latest um the latest surveys you know the, the the um any any real support that there was for a lot of the stuff he's been doing is is, is evaporating i should also just before you come in let me just say um somebody asked um why i was featuring particular comments if you put at walk the world in your comment if you want your comment to be actually um, headlined, um, they come through to a separate queue, and therefore I can I can see them more readily. There are so many conversations going on in the chat tonight, uh, with more than um, six hundred and fifty people in the in the in the room, which is great to have so many on. And thanks very much yeah. for staying with us. Um, it's very hard to see all the other comments, but so if you've got yeah. a particular question or a particular comment you'd like me to see, make sure you use at the world. That'll make sure I see it. Sorry, Tony, go ahead. Oh no. I actually, uh, there was five words I regret saying in my office. I, I said, uh, the market's quiet, right? And I said, I actually like Peter Dutton. And <laughs> I regret saying that. Uh, whenever I used to, um, you know, throw a grenade into the office, it was uh, Lloyd Rainey uh, is totally innocent or guilty, um, disgust, then I'd leave the office. But yeah, I I think the guy makes sense. Uh I don't care what anyone says. I, I like the guy. Maybe I'm crazy. And I think uh, Liberal are, are going to have a chance. You look at what Albo spent wasted on The Voice. Uh, and especially over here in WA, um, Roger Cook, nowhere near as popular as McGowan. And Liberals, a massive chance as well. But again, we have to wait for those cycles. But are we saying, are they the best of bad choices? When anyone that comes out and actually tells the truth about a lot of things um, is going to get assassinated. Let's face it, you have to be a bloody good poker player or a good bullshit artist to be a politician, and I certainly couldn't. Mm. Well, it's interesting because I mentioned I spoke to Gerard Rennick um, earlier on today, and because uh, he didn't get re-nominated um, for his senator position, so he'll be out, I think, next year. And I chatted with him specifically about this issue, you know, how, how come unless you toe the party line, you know, you almost by definition can't participate in, in the political process. And that suggests that, you know, is democracy at risk? And he was said, well, the point is the only way to make sure that you actually get the right outcome is to participate in the political process. And he did say that there's a lot of people who stand on the sidelines and throw rocks and you know, make, make YouTube videos, but don't actually participate in the political process. So his view was, the trouble is, if you're not careful, you end up 
with what you get because by definition everybody else is looking the other way i think there's a lot of truth in that so in a way you know yeah. we are almost responsible as a community for the for, for what we've got because of the fact that we didn't actually participate actively in the in the political processes to make sure that our views and opinions were actually being articulated and because uh, uh, like i said who asked us about massively high migration i mean that yeah, was ne no. that was never on the cards um and, and and if it had been you know maybe people would have had a different different view so i think there's a really important lesson here about the nature of politics and the nature of society when, uh, and how these two things work look at youtube sometimes and i think isaac butterfield would make an excellent politician and mm. if you don't know him go, go and look him up mm. so he's a comedian um but he you know he's straight up honest uh admittedly a bit bit foul in certain areas but there are there are people out there that can see through all the bullshit. as i said i'm not a conspiracy theorist by any measure uh life's far too short to go into all that shit and write letters to the editor but ag again um you've got to look at who who makes sense and for my understanding um Dutton makes sense at the moment so is it going to change my life if Albo gets kicked out I don't know uh am I looking forward to those tax cuts if they eventuate yes but look look at this side issue martin um i don't know how many people have thought of this but two million aussies haven't lodged their tax return yet and if you don't have a tax agent that deadline is today and because the government has axed the offset so instead of a return we've got all these people now worried that they're going to owe the tax office so that's that's another issue as to why spending might come off and why there's a fear of lodging when you, you're not likely to get a return as in previous years so i, I think i thought that was interesting that two million haven't lodged wow. and the tax office will fine you um i can assure you of that because i've copped them over the years don't worry about that yeah absolutely no that's a very very important point okay we're, we're coming towards the end of the show there are two yeah. other quick issues the first issue yeah. I just want to come back to gold, right? Because yep. gold's now knocking, this is the US gold price, knocking on 2,000. And it's interesting because there have been a number of people who've said over the years, no, gold should be valued at 5,000, you know, rather than 2,000. And, and it sort of wobbles around, but hasn't gone anywhere. I, is, is, there a, is there a change in the weather with higher interest rates for gold? Because the question I've got is, if in fact you can get better returns, you know, 5% plus returns from things like um, treasury yields, surely gold intrinsically should be worth less. Oh, absolutely. And I think in this interest rate environment, it's out, certainly outperformed. But you'll hear the salespeople say that, look, gold is to protect your purchasing power, which it has done brilliantly. And silver, so certainly has outperformed and once interest rates eventually peak, God knows where, um, and they start to come off, that's when you could see gold really motor. And what I think will drive gold, Martin, is simply the participation rate and FOMO with fund managers who need to make their mortgage payments on their Mossman house and their BMW. And I think the gold participation rate is very low portfolios are very low in precious metals uh and i think that that could really drive the sector and drive the prices of gold explorers and producers so we're kind of on the cusp but as i mentioned at the start i've got the commodity right but the the gold stocks are the a lot of the mids and juniors are in the toilet um, and beaten up so I, I think that the outlook for gold actually looks favourable. But again, uh, most central banks and investors look at it as a way to protect your purchasing power. And with the, the AUD gold price at 3136 gold companies are going to start spitting cash. They'll start to lock in production at higher rates to assure income, and they'll start increasing their dividend yields and some of them might even start paying 
yields are not quite as high as the banks, but to rival the banks, and that's when you'll see an influx of money because there's no, there's been no, as I say, there's been no greater wealth destruction th than in the hunt for yield. Absolutely. No, well, wealth destruction is exactly the right yeah. way to think about it. And then the other question, uh, which in fact um, Smooth put up a little while ago, we've got the Fed, they're going to do something tomorrow. We've got the RBA next week. Um, my take on it is I think the Fed will probably do a hawkish pause. I don't think they will move. I think the RBA is probably set for a 25, but um, it's not completely certain because of this political influence. But I suspect that they probably will because I suspect that um, uh, in Australia, our rates are still too low relative to some of the other markets. And, you know, another 25 basis point hike is not going to add hugely to the burden, but it sends a very important signal about the independence of the RBA. So that's my call. What about you, Tony? Well, it sends, it sends the message, um, stop, stop spending money. Mm -hmm. It was like um, Jim Carrey, I think, in Liar Liar. He said, you know, stop breaking the law, arsehole. Um, I think we've just got to stop this debt fueled consumer consumerism binge. Stop spending the money. Pull your heads in. Otherwise, we're going to jack up rates. I actually read an interesting article today on Livewire where they're saying that real mortgages, what Australians are paying in Australia, are fifty percent higher globally than the, you know, the likes of the US, UK, and other countries. Fifty percent higher relative to our income position so that's where arguably the the highest uh mortgaged country on the planet and um yeah it's just going to hit the fan absolutely going to hit the fan and uh you know part of me is looking forward to melbourne cup day because it's the first year since of since the age of 18 that i haven't had a bet and i haven't had a bloody drink so um, I'll be watching the interest rate decision more than the, the uh, festivities and the and the ladies that spend far too much money to um, try and look good and look like everyone else. Yeah, all those hats. Um, quick question from Joshua just mm. came in. Um, is RAD still a buy? Well, they've they've come out. Um, look, good question. I'm happy to answer it quite openly. Uh, they have come out with a, a capital raising today. It's at it's about a 30% discount. Uh, it's unfortunately they need $10 million. They've had to offer, you know, the broker at the moment can dictate the terms. It's at seven cents. They've got four clinical trials coming up. Uh, they're looking at imaging and pancreatic cancer. They've got prostate cancer drugs coming through. In uh, non-independent research reports suggest the valuation is multiples of where they are now. And I will be recommending that my clients take up the seven cent rights issue. So the answer to that question is yes, I believe it's still a buy with the usual disclaimers. Uh, the announcement today, yes, it was, it was a bit of a bitch slap, um, to be honest. But these are the types of markets where if you need money, you're going to have to give incentives um, to, to get it. And I, I think that eventually, if the fundamentals stack up, which they are looking good, we will overcome this this dilution. So um, basically, yes, and um, a, a good question, Martin, and I hope I'm right. Great, well, thank you for that. Well, Tony, we've pretty much come to the uh, mm. end, end of our time. I wanna say uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, um, sharing your thoughts and to explain to everybody, we, we just did a free form one tonight for, for all sorts of reasons, yeah. but I think it went uh, pretty well and hopefully it will answer some of your questions and uh, shared a few thoughts and opinions. A lot of uncertainty ahead and of course my thoughts yeah. are with uh, those in conflict areas around the world, um, wherever they are, and also um, in Australia, particularly those who are um, under significant uh, duress, particularly from financial pressures. Um, I always say, in these sorts of shows if you are in financial difficulty reach out and um, if you go to the national debt helpline on 1800 007 007 that is a reliable source of help 
don't rely on some of the other internet um, uh, alternatives that are there. And uh, if you actually do speak to the bank about restructuring your financing, make sure that you're doing the right thing for you, not for them. Because unfortunately, sometimes um, I think some of those uh, solutions are actually more for their benefit than yours. And, um, you know, I think we both agree, Tony, that this is going to be the start of something which is not going to be pleasant for quite some time. So you can't just put your head in the sand and assume that things are going to be magically, you know, click at the fingers and in three months it'll be good again. So you've got to lay the foundation for a bit of a grind. And, um, you know, as we said, the storm is coming. And I think the interest rate storm yeah. is probably um, going to peak higher than it currently is and stay with us for longer. Yeah, yeah. And uh, no, absolutely right. And I think the first thing a lot of uh, viewers can do or those in distress just have a total gift ban for Christmas. Just say, look, times are tough. Let's cut back. Let's not buy eight different types of meats and seafood. Let's not eat leftovers for weeks. Let's just have a, a quieter Christmas and don't spend as much money. And that's the start of having an honest conversation. And anyone looking to get fit uh, pretty much have to take your whole wardrobe to charity do some research on the carnival diet and my cholesterol is fine, guys. I will survive. They're my final words. I will survive. <laughs> well, Tony, thank you very much. I'm glad you are surviving. You certainly look um, mm. um, picture of health, which is absolutely great. And thank I'll make sure I get an up-to-date picture from you for the next show whenever it is <laughs> so that we yeah. um, have a, a thumbnail that meets the current rather than the previous. <laughs> yeah, well, a- I'm, I'm actually below my target weight and... Juliana said, can you stop losing weight? And I thought, well, what am I going to do? But uh, anyway, I hope viewers got a lot out of tonight. I certainly had a lot of fun. And uh, Melbourne Cup Day, um, brace yourselves. Thank you very much, Tony. Have a wonderful um, evening. Thank you very much. I'm going to take you offline now. I'm just going to close the show. See you later. So there you are, folks. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, Tony's always great value and uh, makes some really, really important points as well as a bit of humour too. And we'll have him back on, of course, down the track. Uh, next week, just to say that uh, Damien Classen is on and uh, we'll be talking about the issues to do with the markets from his perspective. So that'll be next week. And uh, the following week, it'll be me talking about the latest from our financial stress and modelling, which I'll be running over the next uh, day or two. So that'll be up in a couple of weeks. So look forward to that. And uh, thank you very much for spending your Tuesday evening with us. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, like and subscribe, please. And uh, check out my other shows. And uh, I'll be back uh, next week, of course, with another one. So uh, as we go, dog is still there. They haven't moved. Amazing. Peace, perfect peace. That's... um, a very good uh, way to end the show, isn't it? This is Martin North from Digital Finance and the Licks signing off. We'll see you next time. Take care.